through our locally based partners around the world. And I've got about 22 years experience in this field, although I have to admit I'm not formally trained in monitoring and evaluation. Everything I know has come from uh, my work uh, with Water First. I'm Susan Davis, and I'm the founder and executive director and general dog's body for Improve International. Um, and I founded Improve International because I was kind of sick of hearing about all the failures in water sanitation and I want to change the way we change the world. So I'm looking at incentives for monitoring, evaluation, independent evaluation, and then what we do with that information. Great. So I'm going to start um, with our presentation, um, talk about why we think we need a rating system uh, for water and sanitation sustainability. Um, I thought I would start out with, you know, we all are representing different organizations, doing different things, so um, I thought maybe start with an example to help explain what we're doing, something that maybe we all have in common and we all buy and wear shoes. So um, this is a, a screenshot from an online service that is used by a lot of people in the United States, it's called Zappos.com. If you want to buy shoes, you can go to this website. You can sort them by, you know, women's shoes, men's shoes, kids' shoes, brand, color, heel height. Um, or you can wear them to the office. Is this for sports? All kinds of information. And but the best part, what I really like this site for, is that you can get reviews from actual wearers of these shoes. So you can find out, do they look like the pictures that the manufacturer put on the website? Are they comfortable? Do they fit to size? And that helps you make the decision on what shoes you're gonna buy. And you can get all this information for a $50 purchase, or even less. Um, so imagine that you wanna take that same amount of money and you wanna invest in a water and sanitation project. This is what you, uh, this is the kind of information you get. The charity itself telling you that they do a great job. Um, and I mean, that's true for, I represent a charity and you have, our donors have to trust the information that, that we provide to them. This strategy of trust isn't working. <laughs> so, I don't know how familiar you all are with our sector, um, but just to give you some background data, you know, nearly a billion people don't have um, access to safe water, two and a half billion people don't lack access to simple toilets. Um, but here are the stats that actually scare me more than that. 35 to 50% of water and sanitation projects fail within a few years after implementation. And Part of the problem is that organizations that implement are not actually doing monitoring and evaluation. Less than 5% of water systems are visited post at least once, just once post construction, only less than 5%. Less than 1% of water systems that um, actually receive any kind of ongoing post construction monitoring. So there's not a lot of learning going on in our sector. Um, that's, that's pretty easy to conclude from this. So what's the result? We, we continue to have failures. Um, I can read you a quote. Let's see. Let me just read you this quote. It comes from a U.S. Agency for International Development report. It has become overwhelmingly clear that the main obstacle in the use and maintenance of improved water and sanitation systems is not the quality of technology, but the failure in qualified human resources and in management and organization techniques, including a failure to capture community interests. An appalling 35 to 50 percent of such systems in developing countries become inoperable five years after installation. So this is a quote that we this is a statistic, 35 to 50 percent. You'll hear organizations in our sector repeating all the time. We have conferences on wash sustainability um, every month of the year. And uh, this quote is actually from 1981. So my point is, in 30 years, this failure rate has not changed. We've been aware of this failure rate, and yet it has not changed in, in the past 30 years. So this is from uh, UNICEF, a survey that they did in 2007, and you can 
see project failure rates in Africa varying from you know 20 something percent all the way up to 70 percent. Um, and then here are just some photos from my own uh, field experience and from Susan's field experience doing monitoring. These are projects that it, it's really not hard to find a failed water project. So um, as we're going and doing our own monitoring, we walk by these and snap photos of them and ask communities what happened. This is a school water point um, that I saw uh, post um, Hurricane Isla support in West Bengal, India. Um, so it was an emergency relief effort, which probably meant that they had to spend money really fast. Uh, they put in this hand pump and absolutely no training, no organization of the community was done. And so users report that it took about six months and then this pump became inoperable. Um, here's a photo from South Africa. If any of you are familiar with a, a system called the play pump system, it was um, designed with the idea that they were going to sell advertising space on a water storage tank, and that advertising space would be used to fund uh, the cost of operation and maintenance. So, um, on every one of these play pumps, there was a phone number posted, and you were to <coughs> users were to call that number a repair line. To, um, to get help if the system failed. Um, but what happened was they didn't actually sell advertising on the tanks, and so users never got a response when they called the phone line. Um, this is a project that I uh, visited just recently in Aromia, Ethiopia. Um, this project would actually meet the UN's definition for access to water, it's actually um, it's an improved water source, meaning that they have capped a spring um, and so appropriately protected it from outside contamination. The problem is there are lots of people trying to access this single water point, and so um, people are still walking a great distance, anywhere from 15 minutes to two hours to get to this water point. And then, because there's so little water coming out of it because it was not designed for the population that it's serving. The water comes out in a trickle and users are waiting in line, fighting with each other in line for about two hours. So failures don't, I would call this a failure. Um, I don't think the people that are using it are too happy with it. But, uh, so a failure doesn't always mean that something has completely stopped working. And then it's not just water systems. Um, you see abandoned toilets all the time in this sector. Um, so this is an abandoned uh, school latrine pit that Susan saw in Nicaragua. So, uh, I mean, based on you know 22 years of coming across these failed water projects and um, attending sustainability conferences, reading sustainability reports in this sector for 30 years. Um, you know, we've gotten kind of fed up, and we, we're not USAID, we're not the Gates Foundation, but we thought, all right, we need to come up with a different approach, and there needs to be some independent information out there about um, what organizations are actually implementing projects that work, and what organizations are, are not. Um, and so we called it an accountability form. It's basically a sustainability rating in WASH. And there's another acronym for the day. WASH means water and sanitation, water sanitation and health, um, or water sanitation and hygiene education. So I'll try not to use that acronym too much. But uh, this WASH sustainability rating we think would have, have multiple levels of benefits. Um, I think the biggest winners in this have got to be poor people who don't have water and toilets. <laughs> we want them to actually have projects that they, that they like and that last. Um, donors, I think, also benefit from this um, because they can, if they have independent information on who's doing good work, maybe they can direct their funds to those organizations. And, you know, we're getting evidence that uh, donors actually want this kind of independent information. I mean, that's definitely true from my own anecdotal conversations with donors, but there's actually some research now that's been done where donors are saying, yes, we would like that information. And then the implementing organizations would also benefit. Um, 
and Susan will describe more um, about how we envision the rating system working and some of the pilot work that we've done. Uh, and we've designed it so that there is a, a peer learning experience that's included in it. And, um, and based on our pilot study, that was something that, that was really valued. All right. Great. So this isn't just theory. We actually tried this out in the real world. Um, what we started with was the criteria. Right? You know, what, what informs this rating? How do you decide what's good and what's bad? And um, what we spent a lot of time on before we did anything is actually vetting and getting buy-in on the criteria. And the unique thing is we actually have expectations associated with this so that um, it's not just yes or no. It's if you have this many of this, then you get this rating. If you have this many of this, that sort of thing. So there's actually high expectations, good work, you know, and then bad work. And I think we also have a cautionary, a cautionary goal. And we have an example somewhere um, of the uh, of the rating system. But we didn't just want to swoop out there and say, here's our criteria, and you know, who are we to decide what the best thing to do? So we had a lot of different organizations um, who sat on phone calls, who reviewed the criteria, compared them to their frameworks. And the interesting thing was that a lot of them said we needed to set our high expectations even higher, which we really loved. So for example, um, one criteria might be you know, how many people in the community have access to this water point. And they said the highest expectation should be everybody. And I think we had it at 90% to start with. So that was really encouraging. And were, there was a lot of interest in this, and a lot, there's a lot of desire, as you've seen in this room too, for some kind of common measurement, some kind of common ground that we can all agree on. Um, one of the challenges with that is, uh, and one of the questions that came up was, there's a lot of different kinds of interventions. So what um, these criteria apply mostly to rural community-based water access projects. Um, there are lots of different kinds of interventions. There might be household water treatment, there might be water kiosks where they're selling the water, that sort of thing. But, we, we had to start somewhere, so we started with these criteria. And I think a lot of them would apply to many other types of um, interventions as well, but some would be more specific. So first thing we did was get buy-in on the criteria. Then we invited, we picked an organization, and we were lucky that um, Water First works through local partners, so they know several organizations that are doing pretty good work. We wanted to start with a success. And they also have a little bit of control over um, their partners agreeing to be rated. Um, which was great. So they had an organization in Honduras called Cose Pradiel, which is a long acronym, but we'll just call the Honduran organization. Um, and they were, they've been working for 20 years in the same area. They, had, they were relatively uh, working in a very um, tight region, so we knew that we could look at their projects fairly simply, you know, look across the spectrum of their projects. Uh, they had older projects, which was great, and they were open to having a whole bunch of people come and look at them, which was great, and they were very, very interested in the process as well. So, I jumped into, can I skip this part? Um, here we go. So what we did is we invited, we, we were trying to think of how credible can we make this. This was really important to, um, to the process, is we wanted the outcome to be useful. We wanted donors to, to say, yeah, we're, we buy into that. We wanted the organization that was rated to feel comfortable that it was a fair rating. So we decided that in addition to having the peers come together, we would have independent evaluators. And we said we'd have two. We decided we wanted to have one that was from Honduras, who would understand the local context and the language, of course. And we wanted to have one who was not from Honduras. And we ended up with somebody from Bolivia, but he was fantastic. But of course, he was very fluent in Spanish. And then we had another woman who was fluent in Spanish, uh, but also who was from the US. And that, again, was just so, sort of off, try to offset any potential bias. And the other benefit of having the peers there was that they would add credibility and vet the process. And they would say, yes, we, we agree with this rating. We saw what you saw. So we went to several, we picked um, out of the list of the whole the body of work that this organization had done, which again was, was easier than maybe a, a large organization because they had only about 200 projects. We picked randomly from a hat, literally a hat, it was a sombrero actually, um, but literally from a hat we picked 
uh, four communities, and we were looking for communities that were had been uh, where there was a water project five years or older. And we went and visited them, and we had the criteria, and we evaluated them, and um, here's an example of a community. This is the water committee, water committee uh, from San Francisco. They're very happy to be talking to us about their water system because it was still working, which was really nice. So here are the, here's the outcome of, to cut to the chase, of uh, Cosa Prandial. And you can see the, the rating spectrum. Uh, they, they hit between green and blue. So overall, they're pretty darn good, which was really encouraging. And of course, within that rating, they had um, some, let's see if we can go back to this. These are the, uh, this is sort of the summary of the um, criteria, the specific criteria, which are things like organizational structure, which is not just the water projects, but how they themselves are organized, um, water source protection, so it's beyond just the water project. And you can see they have one yellow, but mostly they're green and blue. So, let's see. Um, just one of the things we had promised we would talk about is some of the challenges. So, for an organization, uh, you know, pretty small, not a lot of funding. They didn't have, uh, they had pretty good records, but they were all on paper. So when we asked them, can you provide us designs from your projects from, you know, 15, 20 years ago, that was really hard for them to find. Um, and when we asked them things on, you know, how much did each project cost, it was kind of difficult for them to put together that information on a, on a fairly short notice. So we imagine that would be the case with almost anybody. You know, records from 20 years ago are probably not in a database form, um, or even five years ago. Um, we had some challenges with the peers. We, the, even though people were really interested, it was hard for them to peel off three days, three full days, to come and evaluate another organization. Uh, they're all very busy. Uh, they didn't all have the time or the funding to come. Uh, even though it wasn't that expensive, that was still a difficulty. So we didn't get probably as many people as, as would have liked to have come for that reason. Uh, it's, it's very scary. We were lucky, like I said, with uh, the organization that knew water first very well and was comfortable with being evaluated, but for a lot of other organizations, we've asked all of the peers who came, would you like your organization to be next? And nobody's really raised their hands yet. So that is, it's scary. It's scary to be rated, especially if you haven't done a lot of your own monitoring and you don't really know what people are going to find. Um, it was also hard to explain what this was and what the point of this was to the actual participants. So we could have done a better job with briefing them. Even though we talked to their peers in the U.S., they haven't really translated that back down to their colleagues in the field. Um, we thought we might do that. We also realized that nobody has time to read anything before they go to a conference. Um, how many of you read all the abstracts before you've been there? <laughs> um, so we thought maybe we could do it in a better way, maybe a short video, uh, maybe we could do different layers of information, maybe a fact sheet, and then for the people who do like to read, we would have more details. Um, we had challenges with the data collection. We were doing it on paper because the criteria were new. We actually changed those midway. Uh, or maybe after the first day, so we had to simultaneously translate those into English and Spanish because we had participants who had different languages. And data entry was also a challenge, so there's some things we could do with, with some mobile applications that might speed that up and make it more consistent. But a couple of things just to, to reiterate, what, what's different about this from just your typical third party or independent evaluation is we've got the peers there, we've got uh, independent evaluators from inside the country and outside the country, ideally. And we have these expectations, you know, that, that they have to actually, and they're consistent across, ideally consistent across countries, across interventions, so that a blue-green rating for an organization in Honduras means the same thing as a blue-green rating for an organization in India. And as a donor, if you can imagine, that would be so easy, it would be so much better just to say, oh, phew, I don't have to ask you to fill out all these silly you know, due diligence forms, like who's on your board and how much have you spent on overhead. You know, all these things that don't really have anything to do with program effectiveness. Um, so I'll pass it back to you for the plans for the future. Yeah, okay, so Susan asked me to go over this because we skipped it. So, what, you know, why did this reading system work ideally? First, an organization would perform their own self assessment, um, and then maybe that would help them make a decision about whether they're, you know, they think they're likely to do well in the evaluation. Um, and then we would ask them to submit, uh, to answer some questions and submit some documents so we could do 
the, the forum itself could do a desk review um, and see if this organization is, is ready for an evaluation. Then we have the field visit, that's what we did in Honduras, um, that resulted in this rating or, or certification. And we're going to ask uh, member organizations to be part of that field visit, part of that, that peer review, so that we have learning that happens, um, but also, as Susan was saying, it sort of um, legitimizes it. Um, so that you know, we're not worried that an organization that Water First didn't just hire a consultant to come uh, create a report that says our projects are great. Uh, the peers were there and they bought off on, on this whole evaluation process. So this, this rating system, it's voluntary. Um, it's maybe, it's higher standards than um, organizations would normally pursue. It gives organizations, we think, incentive to maintain high standards because now donors have have access to an independent review. And this, this isn't new. This is not a new idea. Um, it's, it's based on other self-regulatory systems that have been implemented in, in other sectors, um, such as fair trade, if people are familiar with that. And then I'll skip down to what are our future plans. Um, so we want to do, conduct more ratings. We want to show that this works with more organizations in different environments. So um, in 2013, we're planning uh, an evaluation of an organization that works in urban slums in Bangladesh. So it's a very different environment than rural Honduras. This also happens to be a partner of Water First, and they, were, um, they have agreed to be evaluated um, like Susan said, one of the challenges of this is to get other organizations who um, are agreeing to be evaluated. So in the meantime, you'll probably see all of Water First organizations <laughs> agree to be independently evaluated. Um, we plan to create this online resource. So like the Zappos.com website, um, we want to create an online platform that donors can go and, and get the results of, of these readings. Um, and we're also working on developing a special fund to support uh, organizations that have gone through this process and received a high rating. We would like to find some donors who would, who would be willing to um, put together a fund that only those organizations can access. We think that would provide um, the incentive that we don't have now for some reluctant organizations to agree to be evaluated. And we're also working on establishing a, a governing board that guides the operation of this forum and does things like review these standards. Um, we did come up with draft standards. We use them in Honduras, but we see them as um, things that will change as we learn from this process. So we want a, a board uh, to be in place to, to help uh, facilitate changes to those standards. And so we started to think through, you know, what would that board composition be? Um, and so we think it would be a mix of, of donor organizations, implementing organizations, um, and, and maybe some government uh, water ministry representatives. Um, this, these are our ideas so far. And I think that's actually the end of our presentation. So um, if you want more information, if you, uh, you know, you, you represent a great variety of organizations. If you think your organization would be interested in participating in this forum or learning more, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so uh, please contact us. Talk to Susan, who will be here um, for the whole conference, and or send us an email, and um, we'd love to hear from you. Pamela and Susan, thank you very, very much. Um, really fascinating, and I know that there'll be people here who are working in this area that will be running up to talk to you afterwards. But I'd, I'd like to open the floor for questions or comments. Sir.
uh, still working after uh, like five years or or based on what I've seen, it's more like um, identifying uh, assumptions or 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 enabling mechanisms for the project to be sustainable. So, because for example, um, I think as Carol referred to the to this as I don't know uh, as, uh, variables instead of indicators. Uh, like for example, if there's an organizational structure, so it's really more of like other elements or components or mitigating. Uh, sorry, mitigating. Um, you call it uh, enabling mechanisms for the project to be sustainable. Thank you, Zia. Well, I, I would answer we're, we've incorporated both into the standards that we've used so far. So we are looking at uh, things like, is this water system actually functioning <laughs> five years after implementation? You know, are repairs being uh, made quickly? Um, but we're also looking at um, the organizational, whoever's responsible for operating the system. So in the case of water systems in rural Central America, there's often a water committee that is set up. So we're looking at um, uh, the function of that, that committee as well. Do they, do they meet regularly? Do they take minutes of their meetings so that their operations are, are transparent? So we're trying to incorporate things that are kind of the enabling environment as well as, you know, when you turn the tap, does water come out? Um, yeah, I'd say just is that we're looking at real world sustainability instead of the sort of prospective what might be sustainable. So I think one of the side effects of all of this, if we can get enough ratings done, is we'll actually know what makes things sustainable. I have a question as well. Uh, Dennis is the name from Sea Change. Um, the question has to do with your uh, peer reviewing. Uh, by forum members. Uh, it gives me a bit the feeling like the like button on pictures of Facebook because people like pictures that are terrible, but if they like them, then they know that the other people will like them back. And I have that same feeling a little bit with uh, the, the peer reviewing by forum members. That's definitely a possibility. Um, one of the things that, that I mean, hopefully that, that won't happen. And one of the things that we're trying to do to prevent that from happening is that we're, we're asking the forum members not to send their executive directors, not to send the people that typically attend um, conferences, um, because it's probably hard for them to leave the marketing behind. And, and that ended up happening in Honduras, actually, for this pilot rating. And it, so you had field staff who were evaluating the work of other field staff. And I, I think that they felt like even though they might be representing an organization like Save the Children or Oxfam, they felt a little bit independent from that because they're not, um, they're not responsible also for raising the money. So uh, my sense in being there is that people were being pretty honest in, in their, their evaluation. Um, but that, that is a question that we have. Um, how can we maintain the integrity of, of peer review when there is this you know, tendency to want to pat each other on the back? Well, I'll just add to that that um, part of the, this report that was written on the Honduran organization was actually written by the independent evaluators. And then we sent it out to the peers who had used the same criteria to say, do you have any comments or questions about this? Is there anything in this that you disagree with? They didn't disagree, but the peers were not actually, they did not inform these ratings um, directly, but they were there to validate the ratings. And um, the other thing is they were actually fairly critical in, in the meetings. They, they had a lot, you know, their feedback was very useful to the organization that we were evaluating because they said, well, look, here's something that we've done, and here's a way that we've dealt with this in Honduras or other parts of Central America. So they were actually more critical than like, but. Quick question. Uh, 
First, first of all, I loved your uh, presentation uh, because you're addressing what I see as probably the most fundamental problem with our industry, and that is a lack of accountability, especially on the side of the beneficiary. The beneficiary, whatever we want to call them, really has no mechanism to hold implementers, donors accountable. You know, it's parliament, it's taxpayers, it's, it's not beneficiaries. So I, I really, really appreciate this. You've stimulated, I think, a lot of thought. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, I'm not an expert on Washington. I don't have the experience you do. Uh, but I do know the question of uh, government ownership of WASH facilities uh, is a deep one uh, within that, that sector. Uh, you know, in the idea, I, on the one hand, governments maybe don't have the capacity to maintain local community uh, WASH facilities, etc. Yet, that they get off the hook, and that becomes an excuse for them not to take responsibility. Um, so that's a key question. I think for a lot of people in terms of sustainability of wash facilities. How, how does your criteria uh, and your mechanism of, of this accountability, how does it deal with that? I mean, how can the government provide feedback or can it, or is that something that you assume? And if she said it, I missed it, and I missed it, I apologize, but could you elaborate a little bit more on, on the government role, especially in that sustain, sustainability aspect, and how we can track that using this tool? Uh, follow through, and if the government ownership is not clear, what is the extent of uh, community self-help arrangements or community assets available, and how did you uh, count it in your ratings? Um, well, the organization that, again, we, we call them an NGO, but they're really not. They're an association of water boards. So, that's one of the things that I found really interesting about the sustainability. They're there forever. Like they're they're part of the fabric of the organization. They're not just an outside NGO that came in and did their projects and walked away. They their members are members of the community. So there's automatic built-in self-help. Um, if they have a bigger problem than the water committees know how to solve, like technically with replacing a pipe or something like that, um, they can they have those people who are right in their neighborhood that they can contact and who speak their language and are there. So that part of it is very interesting. Um, as far as the, the government responsibility, I totally agree with you, but you know, if governments were doing their jobs, we wouldn't be here right now. So until then, let's figure out some way to, to make the organizations who are filling in for them more accountable. This organization though, again, because of the what they are and the way they're structured is they are very active with the local governments. Um, and in Honduras and I think other Central American co countries, they're really decentralizing the responsibility for water and sanitation services. So they're ideally positioned to kind of hand, hand those things over and, and share what they've learned with the local governments as they try to take on these new responsibilities. Susan Mala, excuse me, we've got two last questions and then we wrap up. Uh, Perhaps people can speak to you later. So, sir, you have a question or yes. a comment to make? Um, thanks a lot for a nice presentation. I have uh, two questions. Uh, after the evaluation that you do for the WASH projects, which kind of uh, feedback or the report sharing or recommendation you do for the IP or the implementing organization which they do in their uh, area? And what are the, I mean, there are bad qualities or qualities, but still there are a lot of gap for improvement. So what kind of recommendation you provide for the, for the IDs in terms of technical? Maybe you don't have the expertise in the wash technically, but in terms of implementation and project IPs is implementing partners or something like that? <laughs> I was thinking intellectual property. <laughs> question but then okay so this organization in Honduras this is how I understand your question this organization was rated and then what next I mean what I mean, my question is that when you do the evaluation and mm -hmm. rating after writing the final report yeah. by the fitness experts yeah. you provide the report to the IP or then the yes. yes oh yes what kind of feedback and reaction you get from there I mean yeah. do you see any uh, further further steps see that how they react. Yeah, that's a, great, that's question. a great question. Okay, thank you for clarifying for me. Um, yeah, so they they received the report when, when everyone who participated at, at the same time. Um, 
In Spanish, yeah. So they were able to, to read it and understand it. And, um, and they agreed uh, with everything that was, that was in the report. Um, I, I think it was Carol who, who said earlier that you know, a lot of times when evaluations are done, this is not, the findings are not news to the organization being evaluated. So um, this, this report was not news to them, but I think it did inspire them in a way to start addressing some of their challenges. So one of the specific things that they have um, already addressed, and I know this because we, we fund them, is that they had some projects that were uh, reaching sort of a design life. They were little more than 20 years old. Uh, populations in the community had grown and were putting, uh, so more and more people were using these water systems and they needed to be expanded. Um, so they were trying to figure out, okay, you know, how do we how do we support that? So they um, are actually setting up a loan fund so that those older projects can uh, take out a loan, expand their systems, and, and repay that loan. So that's one way that they're already trying to address one of the one of the findings of the report. Can I just add one of the main comments that they had or, or complaints was that we looked at all the old stuff. And we didn't look at their new stuff where they actually incorporated learnings from their past things. Like, so they, you know, they felt like if we looked at projects within the past five years, we would have seen a lot of awesome improvements. So that, that was kind of interesting. Was there somebody else? Yeah. Hi, um, mine is just a, a comment, really, um, and perhaps to share um, one experience around um, especially water castles um, in, in the communal area because it's, it's usually very difficult to manage communal assets because there's no ownership and um, I come from a village in South Africa as well um, where we've got communal taps, water taps and it just happened by accident that um, the tap that was closest to my house didn't work and um, I bought um, the things that were supposed to be there to make it functional and ever since I did that, which was the maintenance that the government was supposed to have done, but they had not done for three months. So when I got there, I was told the tap hasn't been working for three months, and I decided to maintain it. And ever since I started maintaining the tap, everybody said it was Z's tap. It became my tap. <laughs> and because now there was a sense of ownership, no kids play on that tap because it's my tap. Everybody just goes there and fetches the water, goes home, and nobody tempers with it because it's my tap. And sometimes it takes just a stupid ownership over an asset to make people respect the asset. Because I don't, I think people do understand that it is not my tap, but because I've fixed it, it has somehow become my tap. So people can relate to me, and therefore, because they don't want to disappoint me, they don't want to spoil the tap either. So, 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 so sometimes you have to look at those things. Um, it, 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 it's about ownership. But of course, there's no one size that fits all. Um, in some um, communities, if you start doing something like that, people will start fighting yes. and be up in arms that who is she? Why does she think she's got a tap? So, but it's, it's different things that can just work unexpectedly because I didn't even expect to own a tap, but uh, I'm a proud owner of a tap now. Yeah, can we clone you?